When you're with a child, you're always guiding them to appropriate behavior that's in accordance with your values. If your value is respect for other people, you're guiding the child so that they are noticing how other people react. If they're at the playground and they grab the bucket from the other child, we're gonna say, oh, look at her face. She was using the bucket. We need to give that bucket back to her. So we're always setting that limit. We're not making an excuse for our child to run roughshod over the world. So there's a lot of talking about what everybody needs, but in a very matter of fact way. We're not making our child wrong and bad for taking the bucket or running in front of the waiter. We're correcting them essentially. But before we correct, we connect. Oh, you wanted to run and look out the window. That's why you ran in front of the waiter, of course. And Remember, we talked about this. We need to stay in our seat. There's no shame and guilt. Matter of fact, if your child willingly gives up that bucket or even grudgingly gives up the bucket for something they want more, which is the relationship with you, when he's 10 and you say, it's time to stop building with your Legos and go to bed or whatever he's doing, he's like, mom, you say, I know you love doing that and it's time to get ready for bed. He's gonna, again, he's built the neural wiring, he's able to do that. When he's 14 and his buddies say, come on, smoke some weed with us behind the school, he's like, really wanna do that, but I really don't wanna get kicked off the soccer team. I'm gonna choose the soccer team, right? He's developed the neural wiring for self-discipline. But what would have happened if we just grabbed the bucket away? No neural wiring gets built. He's not actually making a choice. When we don't set limits, children don't learn self-discipline because they're never asked to give up the thing they want for what they want more. But also, when we are authoritarian about it, when we're strict parents, they also don't willingly give it up because the discipline isn't internal, it's external. No, go take your bath right now. They're not developing internal self-discipline. Mm -hmm. And then it more becomes about hiding from the authority to yes. get away with things, exactly. which is what happens when they become teenagers. Exactly. That was Dr. Laura Markham, a clinical psychologist, mother, and founder of AHA Parenting, an incredible online resource for parents looking to build more connection and raise happy, competent, responsible, and considerate kids. She's the best-selling author of two books, Peaceful Parent Happy Kids and Peaceful Parent Happy Siblings, and inspires parents every day to choose connection and coaching over punishment and control. Even having read many different parenting books myself, I've never quite found a resource as practical and easy to implement as all that Dr. Laura shares. I feel honored to have had her on my podcast and ask her many of the questions I have myself in raising our children. We discuss anything and everything from sibling rivalry to if peaceful parenting creates weak and entitled children to the secret every parent needs to know about saying no. And my favorite part, specific solutions and responses to common scenarios in raising kids. This is one I'll be listening to over and over again myself for reminders as I navigate the parenting journey because none of us are perfect and these reminders are true sources of inspiration to take on each new day as our best selves for our kids. Welcome to the Ellen Fisher podcast. Let's get started. Okay, I know you know we can all use a little support when it comes to staying on top of our nutrition with busy lives, children, and the sometimes seemingly never-ending to-do list. Along with eating a whole foods plant-based diet to help me feel my best and most vibrant self, I am obsessed with Anima Mundi Herbal's beautiful selection of products. Founded by herbalist Adriana Ayala's Anima Mundi is an apothecary which uses over 200 different sustainably grown herbs from around the world to create intentional products that contains zero fillers, binders, or flow agents. They're made in the U.S. with certified organic, wild-crafted, and sustainably harvested plants and herbs in a vegan and cruelty-free kitchen. They also use eco-friendly packaging and recyclable glass or biodegradable bags. I love the immunity boosters in their shop, including the black elderberry syrup, mushroom mocha milk, and spirulina, which is an organic, protein-rich mineralizer that tastes delicious in banana mango smoothies. I got a discount code for you guys, so just enter the code ELLEN20 for 20% off your order. Click the link in my show notes below to get this deal. Thank you, Dr. Laura, for being here. I am so excited for this conversation and to pick your brain on all things parenting. And I definitely find your resources to be extra easy to understand. A lot of times when I'm reading conscious parenting, respectful parenting, gentle parenting, whatever you want to call it, resources, I'm inspired, but then I feel a little bit like, okay, but how do I do that? You know, and I just feel like a little, like I'm left hanging a little bit. But when I go to your website, AHA Parenting, 
there's such clear, easy direction on, look, this is this is how you can respond to the specific scenario. And it's very helpful because then the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. So thank yes. you for being here. My pleasure. So first thing I want to ask you is what made you realize I need to get this message out there and help parents about parenting our kids well? When I had my son, I was finishing my PhD in clinical psychology. Right? They don't teach you a lot about parenting, but you do learn about psychology. And here I was with this baby, and I was around other new parents, and I saw that they, well, they hadn't read the same research articles I had, clearly, and they were having such a hard time in general. Parenting is stressful, and they didn't have a lot of support. And I realized that we're, you know, babies' brains, when they're born, are pretty unformed. Babies' neurology takes shape in response to the experience the baby has. Not one experience. You know, if you yelled at your child once, you're, it's not going to change your baby's brain. But babies and children, their brains are still forming, and they form in response to repeated experience. And I realized the parents around me didn't, didn't know that and didn't have the support they needed to give their babies and children the support to shape brains and nervous systems that would be the best they could be in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, to support parents to do that. Yeah. And I think a lot of times as parents, we're just initially start raising our kids in the way that we know how, the of way course. that we were raised. Of course. And then we don't know really any other way. Yes. But I think there's a lot of people, especially people listening, that are like, I want I want to be the best parent I can be for my kids. Yes. So what is the issue with kind of the opposite of what you advocate for, like strict parenting? Mm -hmm. Like wh what are the problems there? So conventional parenting mm -hmm. in the United States and really the whole Western world, conventional parenting says that um, children should behave well. It's all about appearances. It's not about how the child feels. It's not about the skills the child is developing to manage their own emotions. It's not about self-knowledge for the child, which is important for the child to learn to manage themselves. And it's also not about the parent-child connection. Conventional parenting is like manipulation. It's a set of strategies, right? And it's about love withdrawal. Conventional parenting says, if you don't do what I want you to do, I am going to withdraw my love. I'm going to send you to the naughty step you think about what you've done here. And that's a stand in. That's a symbol of what I actually could do. I could put you out the door. And that sounds extreme, but there is a parenting expert who I won't name, who in her book describes how her four year old wouldn't brush her teeth. And she was tired of that struggle. And she took the four year old and put her outside on the family deck. It was in the winter. The child had her nightgown on and no shoes. Now, to be fair, it was California, so it wasn't in the snow or anything, but it was cold. She put the child outside in the dark and shut the door, a four-year-old. That's, um, that's conventional parenting taken a step further. It says to the child, if you don't do what I want, I will cast you out. What we say to the child is, we love you. You're okay the way you are. In fact, we adore you the way you are. You can't always act out all those big feelings you have, but all the feelings are understandable because you're human and we'll help you manage them. We've got you. I think that like a lot of times parents are like, yeah, I don't want to get to that place or, you know, maybe your example or yelling or threatening or counting to count to three or else, you know, but a lot of times parents think, I don't know what else to do to of get course. my kids to listen. So why, why are we acting that way? Why do we yeah. get to that place? Of course. And there are two reasons we get to that place. One is that some kids are more difficult than other kids. Anyone who's been around a lot of children knows they're all different, and it's not just how they're raised. They're all born different, yeah. right? So some kids are more challenging. They're more sensitive. They have sensory, pro you know, they, they experience the world differently than, than maybe I do or you do. So kids are different. That's one reason. It's hard for parents. There's another reason, though. When we parent conventionally, we are undermining the relationship, the natural relationship we have with our child. Conventional parenting that uses threats and punishment. Imagine if you were married to someone 
who use threats and punishment on you. Would you feel close to them? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. No. And so children don't know enough to articulate that, but they don't feel close to us when we do that. And they act out. Mm -hmm. So that's a reason parents are, you know, parents say, he's driving me crazy. Well, he's driving you crazy because he doesn't feel connected. He's either trying to get your attention or your approval or he's given up on it. And he's out for number one because he doesn't think there's anyone in his corner, mm -hmm. right? So, of course, that the effect on the parent is for the parent to think the child is a brat, the child's just difficult, they can't get the child to do what they want unless they, you know how conventional parenting works, you threaten. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, you have to threaten something more. Mm -hmm. So you're always upping the ante. And meanwhile, you're destroying your relationship with your child, basically. Because mm -hmm. you're causing more and more tension. And a lot of it, I've heard you say, it comes out of fear, which is so true. When you, when I break it down, almost every one of my moments that are like, oh, that was a low parenting moment, or oh, I didn't do my best, it's because I was acting out of fear, or I wasn't well taken care of myself, and I was, yes, I was on edge because I didn't get enough sleep, or I didn't get my shower that I really wanted, and you know things, basic needs that I need to be met so that I'm the best human I can be for my kids. So can we talk a little bit about like the fear based aspect? The fear, absolutely, and I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to just be really clear for everyone watching. Every parent has low parenting moments. Every human has times when we aren't at our best. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. Use that. You, you know, it's not a mistake if you learn from it, right? And I just think parents need to, um, maybe the most important thing parents can do is put themselves back on their list so they do meet their own needs. That was a beautiful description of what we're not at our best if we don't get enough sleep, if we don't eat when we're hungry, and et cetera, right? And when we do mess up, self-compassion. It is the most important thing we can do is to forgive ourselves and to say, yes, it's hard. It's hard to be a parent. And then to see what we can do differently the mm -hmm. next day. And apologize to our children when Always. we make mistakes. Yes. And if we, you know, some parents are reluctant to apologize because they think it diminishes their stature. Mm -hmm. So not true. Your child knows what you did. Yeah. If you don't apologize, why should your child learn to apologize, number one? Yes. Yes. That's what I say all the time. And and also, if we don't apologize, there's a way in which not only don't we repair the relationship with our child, we don't if we don't apologize. Also, we don't repair our own sense of self. Mm -hmm. We walk around feeling like, oh, I did mess up. I messed up. If we can redeem ourselves with our child and remake that repair, we can feel better about ourselves. We can let go of that guilt and that shame because shame and guilt are not going to make us better parents. We need to repair that so we can move on with our head held high and be the best parent we can be tomorrow. Yeah. And some of my most pivotal connection moments with my kids are when I am saying sorry. And then they're saying, oh, wow, mom humbling herself. Like, oh, yeah. my mom sees me. Mom yeah. feels my my frustration. Mom cares. Yeah. And then there's like such a great connection moment even from there. So I love that you said that. I think it's so important for people to hear that it doesn't, not only doesn't it diminish you, you can come out of that um, disruption in your relationship stronger. Mm -hmm. You can you you and your child come out with a better relationship mm -hmm. after and, that. And I think a lot of times people want to separate, well kids are different than any of these adult examples you're giving, but can, can you touch a little bit on that aspect? Because when you give that example of, look, if you treated your kids the way that you treat your spouse or the way that you treat your friends, like how close would your would your your loved ones feel to you? How much yeah. would they like being around you? And a lot of times I think people want to say, well it's different. It's different because they're kids. Like, what? what's your response to that? So, yes, it's different because we are in a position with our children where we need to um, set boundaries sometimes. We do need to set limits. In fact, if you're a parent all day, every day, you're probably setting limits, right? <clears throat> On the other hand, it's not different at all. Your child is a human being and the same um, factors that govern any human being psyche govern your child, which is that your child notices when they're treated with respect versus disrespect, mm -hmm. with affection and warmth and understanding versus orders. Right? Yes. And also, I mean, you can relay this to, let's say you're in a partner relation, a partner example where 
one is maybe not acting like their best self because that's kind of what we're relating to kids. Like, okay, their brain is still developing. They have a lot of learning to do. So we're there to guide them. But even in a relationship with adults, one or the other could be having a low moment and they're not being their best self. Like what's going to help you get out of that moment? Is it when the other yells at you, shames you, refuses to talk to you or whatever, has, yeah. you know, punishments? Or is it like a loving embrace, acknowledging your feelings, even if the other thinks that the feelings, feelings are silly? Because, you know, I have a lot of feelings. I have a lot of emotions that my husband sometimes is like, okay, another another emotion. Let's, all right, here we go. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, because he's just not, he just doesn't um, operate the same, like, yeah. you know, place that I do. But him willing to care about my feelings regardless of the feeling helps me in my lowest moments. So I feel like that's a good example too. I think that's beautifully said. And and I would argue that, you know, we could say from this, oh, well, children have these inconvenient feelings. Well, children give us the tremendous gift of presence. They're fully present in the moment. That's why their feelings are so big. That's great. Their presence is such a gift to us, right? Mm -hmm. It just like I would argue that you're a person with big feelings, you know, your husband's in love with you partly because you bring those big feelings to every aspect of your relationship. Totally. And he loves that about you, even if at times it's inconvenient. Yeah. The same thing is true for our relationship with our children. What a gift it is for us that they have these big feelings, even though at times we need to help them to learn to manage them. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, that doesn't happen by our saying, manage your feelings. It happens by us saying, oh, you're really upset right now about this. I see that. Tell me more. And you can always, you don't have to throw that to show me how upset you are. You can always tell me and I will always listen and try to help you, right? So that that's how kids learn to manage their feelings. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So now I want to ask you a very specific question that I hear mm -hmm. sometimes that respectful parenting, gentle parenting causes and creates weak and entitled children. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, well first we should probably... Uh, define respectful or gentle parenting. You you know, conscious parenting, peaceful parenting. There's a lot of words for this. Mm -hmm. And what we're really talking about is respect for this other human being and showing up in relationship with this other human being in a way that is for their highest good. Because that is our responsibility. We said it is different than a relationship with another adult, we're not actually responsible for the well-being of most of the people we interact with. We are. We took on the responsibility when we decided to have a child. We may not have understood what we were doing, but we did take on the responsibility, which is a sacred responsibility, right? So we need to show up in a way that is for their highest good. And we don't have to be perfect, as we've already said. When we repair, we can even strengthen the relationship, right? Okay. So um, that's respectful parenting, I think would be, it's not enough to say that, but that is what we're, that's the kernel of what we're talking about. My particular approach, which I call peaceful parenting, is it's all about the relationship. It's all about the connection with the child, right? And it's about coaching the child to be their best self instead of resorting to control, rewards, punishment, threats, mm -hmm. yelling. Okay. So that's, those are the two big ideas, right? We connect and we coach the child which includes emotion coaching, and it also includes setting up the environment for the child to thrive. That might mean bedtime. It might mean fewer screens. It might mean less sugar, whatever. It, there, you know, Maria Montessori said, don't try to control the child. Control the environment mm. so the child can thrive. That's part of coaching, right? And emotion coaching we can talk more about and give some examples, but emotion coaching helps kids with their emotions. So those are the first two big ideas. But notice what's missing here. No parent who is has not had any sleep, who is, you know, dysregulated, who is upset, and who believes that their child is um, going to be a spoiled brat if they if they empathize with them. That parent cannot actually offer the child connection. That parent cannot actually coach. They're going to resort to control out of their own fear that this child's going to be a brat, right? So the third big idea in my approach, peaceful parenting, is... Parents have to self-regulate. That means you have to take care of yourself. It means you have to work on your issues that get triggered so that you can show up as the parent you want to be and be present with your child. Right? Yes, I love that. Yeah. So those are the three ideas. So 
The question is, does that produce a spoiled brat? If you think that, you will act out of your fear. And when we act out of fear, we go to the lowest place we can come from when we act out of fear, and we're always sorry later. If you, if, if anyone listening reflects on their life and they think those times when my heart is overflowing with love and I relate to the people around me from that versus those times when I'm, I'm scared and I'm, notice how I just tightened up. Like you could just feel your heart tighten up. You feel your stomach tighten up. You don't respond from fear in a way that supports anyone else's growth or your own. You don't support connection. You res- when we get scared, we control. That's what humans do because we're frightened. Mm. So if you come from that perspective, you can guarantee that your child will not be okay. You're undermining the relationship. So I think when people say that, the fear they're really expressing is, if I empathize with my child and they are allowed to have these big feelings, they will be out of control and they'll act badly. So I would say to that parent, they're confusing two things. They're confusing the emotions and the behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, all behavior does come from emotions, but all emotions don't have to result in behavior. I may be quite angry at someone, but I'm not going to hit them. I'm not even going to yell at them. I'm going to look at what's going on for me that I'm angry at them. Maybe they've trespassed some boundary that's important to me, right? And I'm going to express that in words. What we have found through research is that when you express something in words, you don't actually have to act it out. To the degree that your child can put into words how angry they are at their little brother, they don't have to hit the little brother, right? Right. So our job as parents is to say to our kids, you can be as mad as you want to at your brother. You can be as mad as you feel. You tell me about it. I hear you. Oh, and he wrecked your, you got that trophy for your sports and he wrecked your trophy and you told him not to play with that. No wonder you're mad. Of course, sweetheart. Right? It sounds like you have something really important to tell your brother, right? I'll help. Come with me. I'll help. I'll be with you while you tell your brother, right? And you're also making sure he's not going to scream at his two-year-old brother and, you know, you're, you're protecting both kids, but also teaching them to advocate for themselves, right? But notice you're not letting him go smash his little brother, right? Right? Even verbally, mm-hmm. right? So I think that when parents say gentle parenting produces a spoiled brat, maybe they've seen someone who says they're doing gentle parenting who doesn't set limits. That's entirely possible. Or maybe it's just their fear talking that they think that a child who's allowed to have feel their feelings when they when you acknowledge feelings that somehow that is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I think humans always have feelings, and feelings are fine, mm-hmm. and they are part of our experience of being human, and we can express those. And the more our feelings are acknowledged, the less we will express those feelings in ways that are harmful to other people. Mm -hmm. And the more that we're modeled the behavior and emotions, self-regulated emotions from our parents, then I think also the easier it becomes as we become adults maybe to not be super triggered or extra sensitive. Like you still have your feelings, but maybe to not such a high degree where like little things can can hyper trigger you because the way that your parents responded was little things didn't trigger them. No question. You know, we talked about the brain and the nervous system. Okay, you guys, if you haven't purchased anything from Indigo Lona yet, you are totally missing out. You know how a lot of yoga wear can ride up in uncomfortable ways or just isn't super flattering? Well, Indigo Luna is different. I am constantly finding myself reaching in my closet for a piece from Indigo Luna because everything in their shop is made to hug your curves in all the right places. That not only holds your body well, it also fits comfortably and is super flattering. If you don't know what Indigo Luna is, they're ethically made yoga wear, swimwear, intimates, and more. Beautiful, simple shapes, earthy colors, and plant dyes from recycled or organic materials. They are slow fashion and sustainably sourced, so everything is cut, sewn, and dyed by a loving human hand, and they ensure that every person involved in production works in comfortable, safe conditions. The Layla Flares and Broxy crop top are my favorite to wear around the house, and the Tula Poncho is the coziest sweater I've ever worn. It's oversized, warm, and ethically knitted in Bali from deadstock acrylic yarn that would otherwise have gone to the landfill. You can dress it up or down, but no matter what, you'll feel cozy and beautiful in it. So I got you guys a discount code. Just enter the code Ellen10 for 10% off your order or click the link in the show notes. 
when children get yelled at on a regular basis or when they get spanked, people have all kinds of reasons to spank. You know, they might say, well, the Bible says so. And I would just say there are plenty of people who've written about this who say you, have di- you can have different interpretations of what the Bible says, for instance. But we know that when children are spanked for any reason or hit or yelled at even on a regular basis, what ends up happening is the brain becomes reactive. The, the amygdala, the alarm system, these two little almond-shaped Um, places in your brain go, alarm, 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 whenever anything happens that feels like a threat. So when the little brother takes something of theirs and breaks it, to them, that's an alarm going Mm -hmm. off, right? And they will respond the way they've been treated often, right? If the parents respond to an emergency by screaming at the kids, that child will respond as if it's an emergency and scream at his brother or even hit him. Mm -hmm. Or then there's also, I feel like, another scenario where the child goes inward and they're on the outside behaving in a way that maybe you think is optimal, but Mm -hmm. then maybe on the inside, they might not be regulating their emotions well. Is that also something, do you think that's valid? I think that's totally valid. Think about the number of adults you know who try so hard as adults to be good, a good little girl or a good little boy, right? Somewhere inside them, there's somebody who doesn't feel okay about themselves. There's all that shame and guilt and they... Those feelings are so hard to live with because they're beating up on themselves all the time, right? And they end up drinking too much, smoking too much weed, doing, you know, sometimes other addictions like shopping. We do things to make ourselves feel better because we have these terrible ways of treating ourselves. And that starts in childhood. Whatever voice our parents used with us routinely becomes our own inner voice and the way we treat ourselves. Mm -hmm. So most of us have some healing to do there as I said, self-compassion of re of beginning to talk to ourselves like it's someone we love. Absolutely. And is there any research in regards to this like comparison aspect of the different types of parenting? Oh yes, lots. Yeah. Lots. As Absolutely. a psychologist, what yes. are you what yes, are you yes, seeing? Lots. I'm guessing yes. it's showing all these things that yes. you're saying. So conventional parenting is often referred to as control parenting in the research. And you look at uh, discipline techniques that parents use. And if parents resort to control strategies to get their child to behave, those children are more likely to treat their siblings badly. Mm. That's one research study. Um, It's not even one. It's a bunch of research studies. It actually makes so much sense because they're being controlled. Yes. So then they're wanting to control the smaller person in their life because yeah. the bigger yeah. people in their life are controlling them and dictating them maybe more than what's healthy, right? And then they yes. and then they want to do the same to their little little yes. sibling. I've definitely yes. seen that in my own family even. There's certain times where I'm seeing, you know, my older siblings treat the younger siblings in a certain way. I'm like, oh wait, wait, don't do that. Oh wait, I've done that. Yeah. I've done that to them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I've had parents say to me that they hear the same words coming out of their child's mouth that they use toward their child. Right. Yeah. And of course, the opposite is also true, that parents who are more empathic with their child, when they say, oh, I see, you really wish I would say yes to this, and we can't do it now, it's time for dinner now, but I hear how much you wish you could, that when, you know, tomorrow they'll hear, they're they're making dinner and they hear in the other room, the older sister saying to the younger child, you know, oh, I know you wish you could play with this. And right now I'm playing with it, but you could have it after me or something. You yes, know? we definitely have that yeah. in our family too. With all the different ages we have, like I've definitely, I've definitely seen that. It's like, oh, those moments are like, yeah. oh, yay. Okay, I'm doing something right. Yes. <laughs> and then going back to what you said about parenting where someone thinks it's gentle parenting, mm-hmm. but but what is actually happening is there aren't any boundaries. I think that's a very common misconception people have yes. about peaceful, respectful parenting that – oh, you just have no boundaries and your kids walk all over you and they get whatever they want in life and then they're going to grow up to be entitled. Like I see how they get to that place Yes, if they've seen that in real life. So how can we explain that confusion for, because I think some people do get confused. They go, oh Mm -hmm. yes, I love the idea, connecting connecting with my child, you know, and then it goes to a place where there aren't boundaries if they're not being careful. Yeah. So I think it, when you're with a child, you're always guiding them. You're trying to take your cues from the child, right? But you're always guiding them to appropriate behavior that's in accordance with your values. If your value is respect for other people, you're 
guiding the child so that they are noticing how other people react. So if they're at the playground and they grab the bucket from the other child, we're not going to let that happen, right? We're going to say, oh, look at her face. She was using the bucket. She wants the bucket. We need to give that bucket back to her. Or did you did you ask her if she's done with it yet? We need to find out when she'll be done and maybe she'll let you use it after that. You want to give the bucket back and ask her? So we're always setting that limit. We're not making an excuse for our child to run roughshod over the world. Yeah. And when we take our child to a restaurant, we're not letting the child run around the restaurant under other people's feet unless that's the ethos of that restaurant. If it's on the beach and that's what people do, that's fine. But- In general, we're going to have a conversation before we go into the restaurant and say, what's everybody's job in the restaurant? Yes, the waitstaff's job is to get that food, hot food, out of the kitchen safely and onto our table. Such a gift to us that we're going to be able to eat that food. What would happen if we ran under their feet while they were trying to do that? Uh Uh-oh, that would be a mess. And we talk to our kids about it. So there's a lot of um, talking about what everybody needs, but in a very matter-of-fact way. We're not making our child wrong and bad for taking the bucket or running in front of the waiter, but we're, we are saying, and, and also we're, we're correcting them essentially, right? But before we correct, we connect. Oh, you wanted to run and look out the window. That's why you ran in front of the waiter, of course. And Remember, we talked about this. We need to stay in our seat, right? Oh, of course you want to use a red bucket because red's your favorite color. And that's her bucket. Notice I'm saying and. Sometimes when you say but, it sort of invalidates what came before, Yes. right? We're we're saying and. All things can be true at once. Mm -hmm. And our child is not bad and wrong. There's no shame and guilt. Matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And when can we... When can we do matter of fact? When we get away from our own fear. If our fear says everyone in the restaurant is staring at me or the other parents at the playground are staring at me, then we're going to be, don't, I told you not to take that bucket. And then the child goes, oh, oh. And that's what that is, is the shame that we feel we're being looked at and we feel all that shame and we can't handle it. So we dump it on our child. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's how shame gets visited down the generations. Wow. Yeah, that's explained so well. And it, it just, like you said, it's coming out of fear. Yeah. We're, we're afraid of what yeah. people are going to think of us. Yeah. They're looking at us. And so we're reacting out of fear. So what do you do in that particular example you gave where you explained that you wanted to do this and, and then what do you do if they still don't want to give it back? Okay. Totally understandable that your four-year-old does not want to give that bucket back. Or even two-year-old. Or even or two-year-old yeah. especially. Yeah. <laughs> Four-year-old's more likely to give it back. Yeah. Yeah. But but the two-year-old certainly doesn't get yeah. that this was somebody else's bucket. And even if they did, they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> two-year-olds do have empathy, mm-hmm. but they also have not learned that they will always get their needs met. Yeah. And therefore, they're like, I'm going to look out for number one. I'm going to grab that bucket. Yeah. So at that point, you you first of all, take that deep breath because your fear is starting to rise that everybody's going to look at you and think you're a terrible mom. That's the first thing. Mm-hmm. Then you say to the child in question, that because you're trying to make this okay and keep that child from exploding, right? The temperature is rising in the yeah. room or in the <laughs> playground. You say to this child, oh, that's your red bucket, isn't it? And he took your red bucket. You weren't done with it, were you? And the child's like, yeah. so you've already got that child. You and that child are in alignment. The child's not going to explode yet. That's great. Okay. And you look <laughs> at the mother or father and you say, I'm so sorry. We'll get it back. Right. So that you're connecting with, so that now you, you've got a little time, right? You, mm-hmm. You've just bought yourself a tiny bit of time. So, you know, and you feel a little better, like no one's going to think badly of you, but you still have no idea how you're going to get the bucket back, right? The way you're going to get the bucket back is you're going to start by affirming. You're going to connect with your child. You, If your child feels that you have suddenly left their corner and you're fighting with them and trying to get that bucket back, your child is never going to give the bucket back. And you're going to be, you know, unclenching their fingers yeah. and they're screaming at the top of their lungs, right? You may still have to do that. Mm-hmm. You may. Mm-hmm. But you're definitely going to have to do that if you don't connect with your child. So now that you've bought yourself a little time, you turn to the, your own child and you say, that is a beautiful bucket. 
I see why you want it. Meanwhile, your child is like not looking at you. They're filling that bucket as fast as they can with sand. They're like, I've never seen you before in my life. You know, I don't know who you are, lady. And you say, that is a great bucket. You're filling it with sand. You wish you could keep that bucket. And your child's like, you wish you could keep that bucket. Maybe you can use it after. Right now, and you, you give them some other options. You know, right now we have the blue bucket or we can use the dump truck, mm -hmm. right? Or we can go to the water fountain and get a drink. You can, you know, too, too many options for a toddler doesn't work. You really can't do more than two options for yeah. a toddler, right? Yeah. Um, but you decide what you're going to offer as the options. And meanwhile, your toddler's still ignoring you. They're, they're filling up that bucket as fast as they can. And you say, you wish you could keep the bucket. I see you. We need to give the bucket back. Now, what did I just do? I, I totally empathized. I validated. I connected. And I set a really clear limit. And right now we need to give the bucket back. At this point, a two-year-old is going to do any number of things depending on the two-year-old. They might thrust thrust it back nicely. That would be great. Yeah. They might <laughs> hurl it at her head, which yeah. would not be as great. Um, luckily, it's full of sand, so they can't get it very high. Yeah. Um, they might say, no, I won't. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you know, every, every kid's a little different. Um, and you say, you wish you could keep it. I'm going to give you, let's pour. Now, what I would do is I would say, let's pour the the blue bucket. This, oh, look at this sand. You're putting your hands yeah. on the blue bucket. Yeah. Your kid's got a hand on the blue bucket too yeah. and looking at you like, <gasps> <laughs> and you pick up the blue bucket. You say, let's pour. Help me pour. Help me pour. And your child's helping you. If you have a relationship with your, with your child that is about connection, which is our goal, and you've just connected this way, you're saying, help me pour. And your child's like, uh, okay, and yeah. you're pouring into their red bucket, and you say, look at this. You filled it up, and you put that beautiful sand in the red bucket, and you've got the blue bucket here, and you're saying, and let's ask her if you can use the blue bucket when she's ready, when she's done. We need to give it back now, and you're handing it to the mother, let's yeah. say, so it's over your child's head, mm -hmm. and your child's like, ah, <laughs> and you say, you want that. Can we ask? And you model with yeah. you. So people so often say, what if my child won't say he's sorry? Model it. Yeah. What if your child doesn't know how to ask? Model it. You say, let's ask her. When you're done with your beautiful blue bucket, do you think that Koufax could have a turn? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And and she might go, no, as she grabs the bucket. You say, she loves that bucket. She doesn't want to share it. I understand. We all feel that way sometimes. And, you know, that's that. Mm -hmm. And if your child is now screaming, you pick your child up and you hug him. You say, it was so hard to give that back. I am so proud of you. Yeah. He's screaming. Mm -hmm. You're still saying, yeah. I am so proud of you. That was so hard to do. And it wasn't our bucket. We had to give it back. I am so proud of you. It, it's well, hard to give a, something back when you want it. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of times, too, though, the distraction of like what else at this age, mm -hmm. right? What else can we get excited about is enough. Mm -hmm. It's totally enough. Mm -hmm. And we get sometimes parents can get caught up in the like, okay, I have to punish them because they have to learn that they can't take away something from somebody else and they need discipline and punishment. But really, it, it depends on their age as well. Like at, at the age of two, like literally distraction is all you need most of the time. It's really true. Wow, and look at that butterfly. About, yes, yes. But let's talk about discipline is. Yeah. People are confused about discipline. Mm -hmm. Discipline is um, when we decide, when we decide inside what's most important to us and we act on it. So I want this piece of cake, but there's something I want more. I want my health. That's a higher value to me. I'm going to put that health above the cake <clears throat> and act on that. Mm -hmm. Right. And what just happened with the two-year-old? That two-year-old wanted that bucket, but he wanted something more. He wanted that connection with you, and you were connecting. If you had just said, no, 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 we have to give it back, that's not a connection. Mm -hmm. Your child has nothing to substitute, right? Yeah. And we, we wonder when children are undisciplined, when children don't act with discipline, there are two reasons. One is when, they're, when limits aren't set and they're never asked to do that because when we do this, neural wiring develops. So when, if you, if your child willingly gives up that bucket or even grudgingly gives up the bucket for something they want more, which is the relationship with you, right? When he's 10 and you say, it's time to stop building with your Legos and go to bed or whatever he's doing. He's like, 
mom, you say, I know you love doing that and it's time to get ready for bed, right? He's going to, again, he's built the neural wiring. He's able to do that. When he's 14 and his buddies say, come on, smoke some weed with us behind the school. He's like, really want to do that, but I really don't want to get kicked off the soccer team. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm going to choose the soccer team, right? He's developed the neural wiring for Mm self-discipline. But what would have happened if we just grabbed the bucket away? No neural wiring gets built. He's not actually making a choice, right? So, and what would happen if we said, oh, sorry, little girl, we're going to use the bucket for a while, okay? Oh, you don't mind, do you? Right? Again, he's not asked to give up the bucket, right? If we say, oh, I know you want to stay up a little later, go ahead, half an hour or whatever, and we keep, you know, extending the bedtime. When we don't set limits, Children don't learn self-discipline because they're never asked to give up the thing they want for what they want more. But also, when we are basically a bully about it, when we are authoritarian about it, when we're strict parents, they also don't willingly give it up Mm. because the discipline isn't internal, it's external. No, go take your bath right now, right? Mm -hmm. That's external discipline. They're not developing internal Mm self-discipline. And then it more becomes about hiding from the authority to get away with things, which is what happens when they become teenagers. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you're, no matter what age your child is now, you will not believe how fast the teen years come and how they are out of your sight. And they become very good liars Mm -hmm. if they need to. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't have to. My kids told me, pretty much what was going on in their teen years because we had that kind of relationship. And if you want your kids to want to come to you when they're teenagers and ask your advice, start now by making that your relationship a safe place. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And it reminds me of my own childhood because I think my parents raised me with this type of gentle, peaceful parenting without even really knowing the term for it. And I never felt the need to hide from my parents. I yes. always I always went to them and kind of yeah. told them. And like we didn't even have a curfew actually. Like that was mm-hmm. just something they just yeah. trusted us. Yeah. And when I would come home late, it, it wasn't something to be afraid of. It was like, right. oh, my mom would say, oh, you were home pretty late tonight. Maybe maybe next time you should come home, you know, by 10. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. All right, you're right, sorry. Because we had so much trust involved. Yeah. So that is a really interesting factor. Whereas other friends of mine, they were raised with a way where they were getting in trouble all the time, very punitive and disciplined to where when they got to that age of teenage years, they wanted to hide things and they Mm -hmm. hid things from their parents. Yes. So something else you said that I really wanted to touch on, you said about setting limits. So an example, when the 10-year-old, you say it's time for bed, is there ever room for like the art of negotiation? Sure. Because that's something really I'm interested in where kids can grow up to learn how to advocate for what they want. And sometimes they will change my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I tell that to my two oldest, especially like, look, I like, I'm happy to change my mind, but you'll need to convince me why I, why we should change your mind, change the mind. And you do that by you as the parent expressing your concern and the child learning to meet that concern. Mm -hmm. So your child wants to stay up later, but you're concerned that when they have stayed up later in the past, in the morning, they don't get up in time for school. You know, you wake them up and they're cranky because they didn't have enough sleep. Mm -hmm. So you say, that's your concern, right? And so in this case, there's not really something the child can do to get around that concern. Yeah. Yeah. But what they can do is they can say, I know you're concerned about that, mom, that, that I get enough sleep. I promise that I'm going to set, no, I'm not a big fan of kids using alarms. I like them to wake up on their own, but your child might well say to you, I'm going to set my alarm. You can be just my backup, but I promise I will get myself out of bed. Your child's learning Mm self-discipline. There's something they want more than to stay in that bed, which is in the future, they want to be allowed to stay up a little bit later, Mm -hmm. right? And so they would need to negotiate that with you. So I would just say it's always a matter of them telling you what they want and you saying, hmm, I see why you want that. Here's my concern about it. Yeah. And them meeting that concern. And yep. if they can meet that concern, you know, they're going to have a great future 
in whatever profession they choose because they'll be able to move through roadblocks by addressing the concerns of those around them. Yes. That's a really great skill to have. Yes, absolutely. That's what my my eldest is like amazing at the art of negotiation. There'll be certain times where maybe he'll ask for a play date and then me and like my the other mom or dad and the other one, like he's trying to organize like a triple play date and we're like, oh, not today. I don't think so. Because this and somehow he'll convince all the parents that today is the best day to do the play date. It should happen because of this. And we're like, oh, that is true. This is a good idea. We should do a play date. By the end of it, we all think it's a great day to have a play date. <laughs> it's just so interesting. It takes some flexibility from the parent. But I think when we're at our best and we're present, we can be more flexible, right? We don't have to win. We don't have to be right. We can be more flexible. And if we do feel we're being steamrolled, it's also okay to say no. It's also okay to say, I hear how much you want this. I'm going to say no because I actually don't have the bandwidth to figure this out today, but I hear how much you want all three of you to be able to play, and I'm t- I hear you've got it all figured out, and I'm willing to listen tonight. Right now, we need to pick the little ones up from wherever. Yes. So you're allowed to say no also. Yes, and the difference between these scenarios we just explained of the art of negotiation versus your first example of, how about 30 minutes more? All right, 30 minutes more. All right, 30 minutes more. All right, th- that's the passive parenting, where yes. it's just the, okay, I don't want them to whine at me. Okay, 30 minutes right. more. Okay, and then before you know it, things are out of control. Right, and that's not the kind of parenting I advocate, obviously. So when people say that it's permissive parenting, my kids always said to me, well, mom, we have the home where the parents are nicest to the kids, but we also, how come we always have to do the extra credit and we don't get to eat sugar and, you know, we don't get to watch TV. I mean, we had a lot of expectations in our home and a lot of limits, but also the most um, nurturing environment for them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it gets harder to do this, to be this um, present and able to communicate as well as like that example you gave with the bucket or with the kid going to bed. Is it, does it get harder the more kids you have? Cause sometimes I'm like, yes, I want to do that when that happens next time. But then I'm like, I'm carrying the brand new baby. And then my other kid is asking me to go here on the swing with me. And like trying to be present with all five is just like difficult. It is yes. difficult. So does it, do you feel like it gets harder the more kids you have? And what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, yes, because you've only got so much bandwidth. Yeah. You're, you've got the baby crying and you've got the two-year-old into something and you've got the five-year-old asking you for something. You know, think of like a really good preschool teacher, you know, and she's got her hand on one kid and she's talking to another child and she looks up at, over the kid's shoulder and says, ah, uh-uh, Eric, you know, so she's, you can do that to some degree. But it takes a lot of focus and presence and you're worn out at the end of the day. And that's only three, right? So, you know, if you've got five, it's that much harder. Yes. On the other hand, I would say you get better at parenting. I think we are all, we visit our greatest neurosis on the oldest child. We visit all of our hopes and fears and expectations and all the places that we are not fully worked out, the kinks inside ourselves, our own psyches, that gets visited on your first child usually. So the first child usually has a harder time, actually. Mm. So by the time you get to your fifth child, you're so much more relaxed and your child doesn't think, "Eh, it's an emergency, life is an emergency. Your child's like, yeah, mom's pretty relaxed about this. I think things are good, you know. And also they're entertained by the older children. Absolutely. Right, they're designed to be influenced by other children, babies and toddlers. And at at each stage of development, children are designed to be influenced by kids their age and a little older. Mm -hmm. Whereas we just seem like a whole different thing to them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that's also a great thing about having more kids. And then the final thing I would say is that when you have a big family and you've parented this way, your children are likely to be more nurturing. They won't be perfect any more than we are, but they're likely to be more nurturing. And big families have to depend on the children to parent each other a little bit. It's not an appropriate role for them to be the parents, true. They they can't be. They have their own developmental needs. But it is certainly fine for the six-year-old to say to the two-year-old when, you know, when you're trying to deal with the new baby and the baby's crying and the two-year-old's, ah, ah, for the six-year-old to say, oh, your your food fell on the ground. Oh, let me help you. We can do that. We can fix this because someone did that for the six-year-old once. So I do think they have a much more complicated web of relationships and they sometimes feel like they don't get enough parental attention sometimes. So you have to really work at that to connect with each child. 
But on the other hand, they have the richness of all of the other siblings, both the older ones and the younger ones. Um, you know, I was the oldest daughter and we had, you know, my parents were divorced and both had more children. And so I think I learned to parent partly through my, through being with my younger sibs. And that's a great gift. Yes. I definitely find that to be true for sure. My older ones are helping me so much. I don't I, Yeah. It would, yeah. it would be way too hard if I didn't have yeah. their help. They're exactly. helping all the time and they want to help yeah. because they see the way that their dad and their mom like love on the little ones. Mm -hmm. And so they love loving on the little ones too. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. come look, see what, see what Dagny's doing. And they yeah. just love to play with them together and be helpful. So yeah. that's absolutely true. And I know from that description, that they feel loved enough. Because if they didn't, if they felt like they weren't getting what they needed or they were somehow being um, judged for their desire to be close to you or to get loving from you, if that were happening, they would not be able to love on the baby. Hmm. But they're getting the love they need. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> that's really helpful. Okay, so let's get into sibling rivalry okay. a little bit. What causes sibling rivalry? That is that is a big thing for us and our family and all of my friends. <laughs> I think it's a great segue because sibling rivalry is a natural part of having humans who are in competition for the same scarce resource. And the resource is, in fact, parental attention. Now, it may not be scarce, actually. There may be plenty of love to go around, but if we are expressing that love through eye contact and hugs and warm moments together snuggling where they get full attention, that can be harder to come by in a larger family or even, honestly, in a family with two kids. Mm -hmm. When the, I've seen so many families with two children where the oldest has never forgiven the younger one for being born. And it's right. partly because when the baby's born, the older kid looks so big, looks mm -hmm. so big. And you think, you're a giant. You don't need me anymore, mm -hmm. right? Be quiet. Stop waking the baby. Be nice to the baby. You know, we're, we're, we have this attitude of um, you need too much toward the oldest child. And so they don't forgive the baby for being born, right? Mm -hmm. I think we can, you can't get rid of sibling rivalry, but you can mitigate it by accepting everyone's needs. Even your oldest sometimes needs to be babied, mm -hmm. right? We all sometimes need to be babied, even yeah. grownups, right? Yes. So if we can meet their needs, you can reduce the sibling rivalry. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Another cause of sibling rivalry is just difference in what each person wants out of the interaction. And in every human relationship, there will be different needs, different wants. So hopefully with our partners, spouses, we can express what we need and want without attacking them. You know, like, I hate it when you've always got the music blaring. It's sort of an attack, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Whereas I really love quiet. I love when I'm waking up in the morning to have quiet and you've got the news on and it just feels, I, I can't quite cope yet. That's more of a expressing my needs rather than attacking my partner, right? Yeah. Most of us adults don't remember that. Mm -hmm. There are many times we make the mistake of, expressing our needs as an attack. So we can assume children will do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We have to work on that. We have to work on modeling it. And we have to help our children. When when one of the kids says to the other, why are you always singing and humming? I just want to focus on what I'm doing. And we can say, it's hard for you when your sister is always singing and humming. And you love to sing and hum. And I love to hear you hum and sing. But your sister really wants to focus on what she's doing. How can we work this out? You're not making anyone bad and wrong. They have different needs. So one way to ease sibling rivalry is when the children know that their needs will be taken seriously and that you will help them to navigate that difference in needs mm -hmm. so that they can each get their needs met. And there are ways to do it. And I've seen many solutions to that particular thing. Like on even days you can sing and on odd days you can't was one <laughs> family's thing that they came up with. And they did it for years with those girls. <laughs> and it worked for the girls. The girls came up with it and it worked. So that's fine. That's hilarious. And the, and the older one who was the one who was annoyed Stop being so perpetually annoyed at her sister because at least she knew that on even days it was quiet or mm -hmm. whatever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what about specifically when the older sibling can often get the blame for things? Yeah. So let's say they're like older kids because we did a couple examples for like toddlers, but older kids that are just arguing a lot and a lot of times it's instigated by the older one and maybe it's a personality clash. Could sometimes. it sometimes be that? Mm -hmm. And 
maybe it's the competition thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or modeled behavior from their parents. How yeah. do we navigate that when, let's say a specific example, your older brother starts attacking the younger one for who knows what. They took the Nerf gun. Yeah. They took the Nerf gun. gun. Or or maybe the older one was, was shooting the Nerf gun at the younger one and the younger one said, stop it. I don't want, stop it. No, stop, stop. I'm not playing, stop. And he kept going, kept going until he hit him in the face and it really hurt. And then there's a huge wail mm-hmm. and then they attack each other. Okay. So let's use that example of the Nerf gun and he, he gets hit in the face. What does every single parent do in that moment? They get mad at the older kids. Yes. Yeah. They come running into the situation, screaming at the top of their lungs. Meanwhile, they've got a crying child here yeah. who they're not even taking care of. They're screaming at the top of their lungs, you know better. You're the big brother. You heard him say stop. Mm-hmm. So what are the takeaways from each child? Hmm. Takeaways, I think, from the younger child is the louder I scream, the more mad the parents get at the older brother. Yeah. That's also one. Mm-hmm. And maybe also that the older brother gets attention, but even though it's negative attention yeah. from yeah. the parents. Um, the older one? Oh, I don't know. But for the younger one, also that like no matter how they acted in the moment, it's not their fault because yeah. the older brother. Good. Yes. Good. And they might have been taunting the older brother before this. We don't know what happened. Yeah. We can't. We're not omniscient. Yeah. And even if you were watching out the kitchen window and you know exactly what happened in that moment, you don't know what happened an hour ago or yesterday. Yes. The build up to this, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the older one's takeaway is... <sighs> Mom always takes his side. Yeah, yeah. She's his fa- He's he's her favorite. Um, she never understands me. It wasn't my fault. You just wait till I get him alone. My whole life has been bad ever since he was born, and it's all his fault. Yeah, right. He he's angry. Have we just helped our children get along better in the future? No, no. <laughs> and you notice what happened is that we made it worse by the way we came into the situation. Mm-hmm. Now imagine that instead, we were had just listened to this podcast and we were able to take even as we're running to the sound of the yelling the crying we're taking a breath and we're saying we're saying to ourselves i can manage this it doesn't mean my older child's going to be a serial killer it doesn't yeah. mean they're never going to get along it's going to be okay He's, he, i don't have to take anyone to the hospital it's going to be you know whatever we need to say to calm ourselves down in that moment we we come out we ignore the perpetrator completely ignore the older child Mm -hmm. and go immediately to the child who's crying. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Ah," and he's got a big red spot on his cheek where the nerve gun hit him. And And you put your arms around him. You say, oh, that really hurts, huh? Oh. Now the older child's watching this and you're completely ignoring it. But if you're calm enough, you can take this up a notch. You can Mm -hmm. say, quick, whatever your kid's name is, Cody, get an ice pack. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. If you can do that, if you can do it nicely to Cody. Yeah, yeah. You've just given Cody, the older child, the opportunity to come back into the community of the family again. That's By brilliant. being a helper instead of a herder. Yeah. Right? He's wow. redeemed himself. But maybe you can't even do that because you're just mad. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. you just take care of the little one and you're like... Oh, that really hurt. Ouch. Let's go get you an ice pack. Let's go get you a warm, a wet washcloth, whatever. And you take care of him. And you come and you let him tell you all. Of, you're taking him away from his brother. You're not like making, rubbing the brother's nose in it. You're just helping the younger child calm down. And he tells you all about it because that's part of calming down. I told him to stop and he wouldn't stop it. And you say to him, it sounds like you have something really, yes, you're right. Our family rule is stop means stop. This is a basic rule in any human relationship. It's the foundation of all consent. Mm-hmm. Very important that kids learn stop means stop. And it's not unusual for the older sibling or the younger sibling to not listen to that. And we need to reinforce it. It doesn't mean your child's going to be a bad person. It means we need to reinforce that rule, that limit. But we listen to the younger child and we say, and you said stop and he didn't stop. Ouch. That makes you so sad and mad. You felt so bad when he did that. Your, it, it hurt your face and it also hurt your heart, I think. You know, it sounds to me like you have something you need to tell your brother. Once your child is calm, you, you take them to do it. But right now you say, I'll help you when you're ready. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. And, and yeah. you say, once, we fix, once your face feels better and we take some deep breaths, then you'll be strong and rooted in the ground and you'll be able yeah. to go and tell your brother what you need, right? So we're not going to just fly off in a rage yeah. to tell the brother. So we've, we've helped him. 
And if the child who's not, you know, who got hurt is has a type of personality that's more quiet and mm-hmm, inward mm-hmm. and just may never really want to like say it outwardly, do you mm-hmm. do that for them, with them? Yes, you do it for them and with them. You yeah. you help them do it. But right now they're hurt, so they are telling you and you say, you you're notice I was really putting it. I was saying, your heart must have hurt too, right? Because a child doesn't know how to say that it that was a betrayal when they said stop and they got hit in the face, mm-hmm. right? So you say, you said stop, and then he didn't stop, right? And then hit you in the face. You're articulating it so he knows, yeah, what happened was wrong, and, and I said stop, and that should have been respected. I had a right to expect to, to, to be listened to. So we're helping that quiet child develop the ability to stand up for himself simply by acknowledging what happened to him and that now he sounds like he feels really upset about it and he wants to to tell us he has not he wants to because he he both wants to and doesn't want to he adores his big brother he idolizes him he wants to play with him big brother barely plays with him he wants to let make him play with you know there's all kinds of complicated feelings so i wouldn't say he wants to tell him the quiet child i would say it sounds like you have something really important to tell your brother Mm-hmm. that you didn't like it when you said stop and he didn't stop. And he's like, I didn't like it. So we're going to tell your brother. Yeah. I can't. And you say, I will help you. Mm-hmm. I will help you. And when he's ready, you might even say, let's take a break first so we calm down first. What would you like to do now? Maybe he plays with his little figurines to calm himself down. And you say, let's set you up with your figurines so you can have a few minutes just to play and I'm going to go talk with your brother. And you set him up and you go to the brother because you want to soften the brother a little bit. Because if he sees you coming with the little one, he's going to think, okay, now it comes. She sides with the little one, right? Yeah. So you want to you want to get him set up with something so he can play for a little bit and calm down. And, and you've just given him probably 15 minutes. You've given him a little time. Now, if you have a baby, this is a little harder, right? Because you've got so many things going on. But yeah. you can have the baby on your hip while you yeah. do this. Yeah. And you go to the older child who did this and you say, wow, that was hard, huh? Notice I didn't say you're bad, you're wrong, you didn't stop. I say that was hard. Now, he's acting like he's never seen you before, doing whatever he's doing. And you say, he, your brother was really crying. He had a red mark on his cheek. You're just describing what happened. You're Now, you could say you're guilting him, you're shaming him, but notice it's a pretty matter-of-fact voice, mm-hmm. but you're describing what happened. And you say, when you, when you were shooting at him, you know our rule is that we don't shoot at the face, right? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> you say, um, and you know our rule is we say we, we stop, you know? He's like, yeah say, you must have been pretty upset to keep shooting. In that moment, it must have been so hard. It was hard for you to stop. You kept shooting and you shot him in the face. I didn't mean to hit his face. He was moving. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you didn't mean to hit his face. I, you just take that face out. You don't say yeah. you're lying to me. You say, you say, I'm glad you didn't mean to hit his face because our family rule is this because you know if it hits your eye, it could be really serious. You know that. So, so I'm really glad you didn't mean to hit his face. And I know if he's moving, it's hard. And it must have been really hard for you to stop because he was saying stop. And it was hard for you to stop shooting at him. And he doesn't know what to say at this point because he doesn't really know why he couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And you say, sometimes it's hard to stop when we're we're doing something that we want to do. It sounds like that was really hard for you. Do you remember what happened? And he's like, yeah. I mean, he's still, you know, yeah. and you you say, um, I know you love your brother and I know you must have had some other feelings going on. Like maybe you were mad at him or maybe, I don't know what other thing there could be. I was trying to do something a little more innocuous, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's like, I just wanted to bug him. Uh-huh. And you, you were, were, yes. Yeah. You, maybe you were mad at him because, you know, before he wouldn't listen to you, whatever, um, and then usually as you acknowledge what might be true for him, there's usually a point, a tipping point, where instead of, hmm, hmm, he goes, yes, you know what, ah, you know, I wanted to bug him. Here's yeah. why. Yeah. He never blah. He always blah. You know, yeah. whatever it is. And it spills out. Mm-hmm. And parents are like, 
<laughs> I cannot believe this. I've raised a monster. No, this is good news mm-hmm. that it's out instead of in. Remember, if he articulates it, mm-hmm. he doesn't have to act on it. Mm-hmm. We want to prevent this from happening in the future. And as he spills out all the stuff, you say, wow, wow, oh, I hear you. It's so frustrating for you when he always, it's so upsetting to you when he never. Mm-hmm. You just, you don't even have to agree with him. You're acknowledging how he feels. Mm-hmm. That's totally appropriate. And he unloads and he unloads and he unloads and you acknowledge and acknowledge and acknowledge. And at some point he's done. And he's sort of shocked that you're not, that you're listening and that you're- Not blaming blame, him. Not blaming him, exactly. And he's like, hopeful. Like maybe you do understand him a little bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody is in his corner. And he's like- Yeah. <laughs> you're like, wow, maybe I, I have a parent who cares what matters to me, right? Mm-hmm. Even though I was terrible and shocked. Yeah, My they brother, know. And, yeah, yeah, they, they know. know. Even though I was terrible and did this thing. And so he spills all this to you and you're like, oh, oh, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. And then he comes to a point where he stops and you give him a hug. You haven't said anything like you're bad and wrong and did the bad, wrong thing. You are you have said what your family rules are, right? And you might not even have said that yet. You He might have just started to offload right away, right? Um, so you give him a hug. You're not done yet, but you're giving him a hug and you say, I am so sorry this has been so hard for you. I want you to know that you don't have to keep this all inside. When you feel like this about your brother, you can always come and tell me, and I will always understand. Sometimes it's hard to be the big brother, right? You're just, you're you're validating everything, and you're making your relationship safe for him to come to you for help and articulate so he doesn't have to act it out on his brother, Mm -hmm. right? I just wanted to annoy him by shooting him when he said no, right? Yeah. And then you, so you've given him a hug, you've said this, and he's like, what I have seen happen is I, I remember with my own son when he was little and his sister was born and I would say, it's so hard for you when she's on my lap and nursing all the time and you just want me to come and help you with your trains or whatever. He would, he would, he would start from a place of like, I hate her. And then he would, you know, I would give him the hug and he would just sort of melt in my arms, just melt. Mm-hmm. And then he wouldn't necessarily say anything, but he would go over to her, maybe not even right then, maybe he'd go play with his trains. But a half an hour later, I'd see him go over to where she was sleeping and pet her gently. Because when we allow all of the ugly feelings, ugly in quotes, to come out, then all the love that's in there can has room to surface, right? And the child can feel it. If they've got all that ugly stuff inside and no safe place to take it, that's going to control their behavior. So notice there's still one piece we haven't done. We've yes. hugged him and he's melted in our arms and he's taken a deep breath like, yes, I have my parent and they understand. And then we say, "I, I you reaffirm that you understand and you say, and when someone says no, We have to stop Mm -hmm. what we're doing. No means no. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's one of our most important family rules. And he's like, I know. And you say, I know you know. And sometimes in the future, it's still going to be hard for you. Next time this happens, that you feel like that he says stop and you feel like it's too hard to stop, what could you do instead? And then you help him come up with a scenario. Like you might even say, here, Here's the, here's the teddy bear. The teddy bear is, is your brother. And it's saying, no, no. And you've got the Nerf gun. And you want to keep shooting it. What do you do? And he, he, maybe he says, I could turn and shoot it over there. You say, yes, because it's always easier to redirect the impulse than to stop an impulse, always. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's an example of what he might do. Or he might say, I could shoot it in the air. Or he might say, I could say to him, and he might come up with something mean to say to his brother, like, you're such a coward. And, and at that point, let's say it's a bad thing he comes up yeah. with. You say, hmm, well, that would make you not not make you stop shooting. He said, yeah, but I would still get to say, you know, and you yeah. say, so those mean feelings would still come out, huh? Hmm. I wonder what would happen then. Yeah. This is how we help children develop good judgment. You could do that. I wonder what would happen then. Yeah. It would still be an attack. It would still be hurtful to the brother. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And is that what you would really want to do? No. Okay. So let's come up with something different. Maybe you're going to move the Nerf gun. But the point is, and you can come, and what if you still have those mean feelings inside you? What are you going to do then? You can come and talk to me. Come and talk to me and, or scream, mom, I need your help, mm-hmm. you know? And 
I will, if I can, grab the baby and come. I can't always come, but you sometimes I'll say, come to me. And you and you, I will always be there as your lifeline, mm-hmm. right? I just think we um we ignore these opportunities to help our children repeat this in the future. If you did this, you're not going to have that Nerf gun incident again, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And parents, I know, I know the parents listening and watching are going to say, I don't have time for that. Yeah. I, 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 are you kidding me? <laughs> I know. I was just going to bring that up. The answer is it takes three months. Mm-hmm. The answer is that I've been doing this for many years and I've watched many thousands of parents do this. And it gets better every day because as you rewire your own brain, they're rewiring their brains and they become more able to manage themselves, right? But also, over a three-month period, that's a very short time in a child's life, even a 10-year-old's, they learn how to do something different. Mm -hmm. And you'll start to hear something where the kid will say, stop, and the other kid will say, oh, I'm not going to play with you anymore and toss down the Nerf gun and go. And the younger will come running and say, he won't play with me. And you can say, oh, you're so disappointed. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't shoot it at you anymore. I heard you say stop and he stopped. Good for you for sticking up for yourself. Give me five, yeah, right? Yeah. I love the way that you broke that down. That's so, so helpful. And it's applicable to everything with siblings. Mm -hmm. And I think for anyone listening who's like, okay, I don't have time for this. Or no, that's coddling the kid. That's going to spend too much time coddling. And then you're going to raise whatever. What's the coddling part? I don't don't know. know, Because I don't see how that's coddling. We didn't shame and blame the older child. Right. Instead, we said, you know the rule. Yes. And it sounds like it was really hard for you. And you can't break that rule. So what are we going to do differently next time? We taught the child how to manage themselves. So true. That's what we want to be different. Do we need to... I Make know. him wrong and bad to do that? Absolutely. Is that if you're at, at your workplace and you have a boss and you mess up, the equivalent, like you knew you shouldn't have done that thing, point the Nerf gun, the equivalent, yeah, yeah. whatever yeah, it yeah. is in your office, and you did it anyway, and your boss comes to you and says, shames and blames you. Is that going to make you do a better job next time? No. no. When we have shame and blame inside us, we act badly. Yes. And your son will also, or daughter, will also act badly if there's shame and blame involved I know. in their brain. I know. And I think when people try to say that whatever you just described is coddling or it's whatever the word that they attach to it, they have this fear that they're going to grow up and be this like, I don't know, entitled person. But I, I think what they're forgetting is that when, when we do the parenting, the strict parenting, the example you gave where you just come attack, shut down the emotions, then we have so – this is why we have so many adults walking around that don't know how to regulate their emotions. Yes. That don't know how to how to express yes. even what they're feeling, especially boys, but it could be boys or girls. Yeah. But a lot of times boys grow up and, and then they get in a relationship and the partner's like, why can't you communicate with me? Like, let's talk. And they're like, I, I, I don't know even how to say it right. because of what – how they're ra- being raised was. Yeah. We, we don't want to raise people who never get angry. That would be impossible. We want to raise people – who notice when they're getting angry, back when it's annoyance or frustration, before it gets to be rage, right? We want to help us help our children notice and put it into words and advance their own needs in a respectful way that doesn't dump on other people, right? Every, You know, we girls and boys, we want them to stick up for what they want and need in a way that is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. And healthy communication. And yet yeah. for, for some reason, I think people assume that as adults, we're supposed to be this like stoic, like we don't have, we don't have to express ourselves in a certain way and that makes us strong. But really that doesn't, a lot of times that creates so much havoc in actual relationships because then they don't know how to communicate well because problems always arise. There, there are going to be problems in life and we need to be able to communicate well to get yeah. through them healthfully. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And so is there a point, is there any kind of requirement in that scenario where the older child has to say sorry? Mm, yes. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because we didn't get to that. So once you've gone through this with your child, you then say, you know, your brother, he he had this big red mark on his cheek. It's probably faded now. He's fine, sweetheart. You know, you make sure to say that and you touch your child, you know, you're connecting and you say, and his heart was hurt that he said, stop. And you didn't stop. You didn't hear him. You didn't respond to what he asked. And he felt a little betrayed. I think that his brother who loves him, his big brother um, didn't listen and, and did something that hurt him. He he needs to be able to tell you that. And he's like, you know, but you've just understood him and he knows what he did was not okay. And you say, let's go find your brother. And by now his brother is happily playing with whatever. And you go over and you, you, you touch both children. You don't just ditch your older child because he'll feel like, 
okay, she listened to me, but now she's on his side again, right? You keep touching him and you also are touching your younger child. And you say, we have two boys here who love each other so much, two brothers here who love each other so much. And sometimes they have to work things out. Sometimes there are hurt feelings. Sometimes there are hurt bodies. You have something you want to tell your brother. And maybe he's the quiet kid who wouldn't tell his brother. And you say, do you remember what you're going to tell your brother? And he's like, don't hurt me. You know, he doesn't know what to say. And you say, don't hurt you. And also when you say stop, you want him to hear you, right? So you help him do it. And he says, yeah, when I say stop, stop, right? Stop. You might even say stop. You know, he might have an uh, stop. You know, he might be not sure how tough to be in this, you know. And the older child's like, okay, right? And you say, so we need to make things better. We need to make a repair. You're not going to mandate, okay, you lose your screen time for a week or whatever. You're not going to do that. You're going to say to your to the child, I wonder what you could do to make things better with your brother. And, you know, if, if there's still a red mark on his cheek, he could do something like that. And, and he can also say, I mean, maybe he won't have any ideas. If you, if you're just beginning this, he wouldn't have any ideas. If you've done this a few times, he's going to say, we could play Nerf guns and we could practice you saying stop and I will always stop, which would be an amazing repair, a corrective repair where the younger child would feel hurt. That'd be great if that was what they decided. Or he could say, I would help you with the thing you wanted help with, teaching you to throw a ball or whatever it was he was going you know, that he wanted. I'd let you play with me while I do X, Y, Z. could be anything. If both kids feel okay about it, your job as the parent is to accept it. But if, it, if it's something that you think is really not very much of a repair, like, like say he's like, I'm sorry. Yeah. You could say, then first of all, you make a mental note. I did not do enough work with this child. He's not actually expressing sorriness. So I need to listen to him more. It's a it's a big chip on the shoulder he's carrying around. We need to melt that a little bit over time. So is that I'm guessing that's not a place to be like, oh, that's not a good enough sorry. Oh, I would ask I would ask the other child. Okay. I would say, so your brother said he was sorry. Did you feel like that makes things better? And Many children will say, no, he said, sorry, mm -hmm. right? Many children will say that some kids would be like, yeah. yeah, and you could say, it sounds like you don't really think that made things better if he's just sort of hesitating. And you can, and you can say, you can say that to your brother. We're always coaching them to speak for themselves if they can. And when they can't, we step in. So he might say, the younger child might say, you're not really sorry. Mm -hmm. And, and the older child looks and you say, and you, you remember, you're touching both. You might even put your arm around and give them a hug, even if you have to let go of the little one for a minute. Mm -hmm. And you're, and you say, it's hard to apologize. It's hard to apologize. And your brother loves you, and I know you love him. And even though that was really hard and you feel bad about it, what happened? It's you need to make it better. Is that something you can do right now, or do you want to wait until? Like my daughter used to say to me, I can't apologize when I'm mad. You're asking me to lie. Mm -hmm. but I can do it later. Yeah. And that was our deal. She yeah. was allowed to do it when she was ready as long as it was before the next meal. Yeah, yeah. Right? Oh. They can't go to bed. I mean, if, if there's if it's going to be before breakfast, it's like they have to do it before bedtime. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but maybe he's like, all right, I'm sorry. And you can say, does that feel better now? Okay, hug it out. Yeah. And the, after, after they both feel like it's a decent enough um, repair, then you can say, okay, you ready to hug it out? Because I find that when kids hug it out, they always end up laughing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's so good. And do you ever find that there's a place to say, oh, go to your rooms together and work it out on your own? Um, I think that we um, were told to do that instead yes. of intervening. That's we as parents. That's what my mom told me. Yes. To do. I've even talked about this yes. on this podcast. That sometimes that that is what I do. And I'm like, you know what? You guys work it out together. So so – we, what happened is that um, somewhere along the line, I think um, we were told that it, when we intervene by coming in and screaming and saying it's all your fault and making one of the kids wrong, it worsens sibling rivalry. No question. We know that from the research. So parents were advised to let the kids work it out themselves. And what we found out is that if the parents just like she's at the kitchen sink or she's working at her computer and the kids are screaming at each other and working it out themselves and they did a lot of filming of this. And what they learned is that this the child who is the strongest child wins. Mm. It is usually the older child, but sometimes it's the younger child. 
sometimes it's the one who's willing to make the most noise. So that could be a younger child Mm -hmm. to finally get the parent involved, right? Mm -hmm. But usually what happens is if the parent is, I'm not going to get involved, I'm letting them work it out, they're going to learn how to do this. What they learn is not, you know, we just taught them so many skills, Mm -hmm. right? No, that's not what they're learning. They're learning if they bully the other child, they win. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do. So we're teaching bullying. And when you ask the children, you've been filming this, right? Mm -hmm. You're the researcher. You ask the children, they'll say, mom and dad think it's okay that he treats me that way and threatens to hit me because she was right there at her computer and she didn't intervene. Now, maybe you didn't even hear it. No, But they take it. If you're in the house, it's a tacit endorsement of the behavior. Yes. So that's a terrible thing to teach them. Yes. Now- I will say it's not always a terrible thing to have them work it out, but first we have to do what I've been describing. Yeah. First we have to teach them the skills. Mm -hmm. Then after we've taught them the skills, if let's say they're roughly equal in power, you know, Mm -hmm. you've got a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old and the nine-year-old is pretty good at sticking up for herself, let's say. Yeah. Um, And they're fighting about, I don't know, um, which movie to watch. You do not have to, if, if, if they've, if they know that basically they have the skills, you do not have to help them figure out which movie to watch. You can say, okay, well, you know, Saturday night is movie night and you can watch, you know, any of the movies on this list or whatever. They know what they can choose from. Um, And you two get to decide. um, And I hear that you want to watch this movie and she wants to watch, and you want to watch this movie. That's a hard decision. Maybe one of you will convince the other, or maybe you'll decide on a third movie you want to watch, but that's up to the two of you. Of course, go off and you do not need to be in the middle of that. That's good yeah. for them to get the skills of learning. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like we've done like a little bit of half and half of what you're talking about. Like those that example you gave of connecting them, like we have foundational principles of that. And then there are certain times when if we are too busy, that is part of it. Or if it's like feels sometimes like, oh, maybe th- sometimes there's a fear I think of, oh, if I give the the one who's screaming too much attention that they're going to want to scream more. Mm. Like that, 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 oh, they're screaming louder and louder to where now I can't tell the difference between a Nerf gun in the face or the child's actually fallen off a cliff. You know mm-hmm, what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and so it, there's that, that type of fear as well. Sometimes I think with parents are like, okay, I think I need to let them work it out themselves and not be the one that's, but not, not picking sides, but your example doesn't pick sides. Yes. So it's, it, you're yeah. never picking sides yeah. with my example. I think yeah. that's the most important thing because yes. when we pick sides, yeah, even if we don't mean to be picking sides, when they experience it as picking sides, the one who experiences not being picked always feels like they're not as loved. And I do this. I do this in front of audiences. I'll bring up two people from the audience and I have them fight with each other as siblings, people who don't know each other. Yeah, yeah. And then I intervene in different in both ways and demonstrate for the audience. And when I intervene as making one person bad and wrong, they always say the same thing. They say, you don't love me as much. Mm-hmm. And the other one is like, I won. Yeah. I won. And not only that, they'll sometimes say, and this is borne out by the research, I have to keep my sibling down. I have to keep complaining about how my sibling does these things and and crying and whining and escalate my upset to show how my sibling is bad and wrong because I like to be the favorite. And mm-hmm. this makes me the favorite who always wins. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they can't even articulate that, but that is kind of the underlying the pin. So it just shows how important it is to not pick sides. It, it always makes the sibling rivalry worse. So when you said what causes sibling rivalry and I said, well, competing for scarce resources, difference in needs, the third reason is the parents. Mm-hmm. The parents create the sibling rivalry by picking sides. Oh, that is so, so helpful. Do you have any other tips then for sibling rivalry as we're listing in this? Is there any yes. other important takeaways? Yeah. Yes. The research. I feel like is, I have a whole book on I, it. I, I do have a whole book on it. <laughs> yes. Peaceful Parent, Happy Siblings. Yep. How to Stop the Fighting and Raise Friends for Life. That's the book. But I will say the research is very clear that I, as the parent, influence the sibling relationship, not just by the way I discipline, we talked about that research, but also by my closeness with each child. When each child feels like, yeah, my mom, my dad, they're in my corner, they adore me, no matter how much my siblings get, there's enough for me, more than enough for me. When your child feels that, why would they feel sibling rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a tall order for parents, right? But we want each of our children to feel that way. We want to find, I once talked to a man who had had 10 children in his family. And I said, how did you feel like, did you feel like there was enough love to go around? And he said, well, 
There were certainly times when my mom was busy with the other kids, but she always found time to connect with me. Every single day she would do something. She would like come over and and put her arm around me and say, hey, come here to the window for a minute and look out at the stars together. Or, you know, she would, you know, at the dinner table, she would give me, she would say, I know you love mashed potatoes. I'm going to give you a little extra. And the other kids would be like, I want extra. And she'd say, there's plenty of mashed potatoes for everybody. Give me your plates, you know. So I think that attitude of there's more than enough love to go around and I'm going to find opportunities to just, just, just to walk by my kid when they're at the easel and say, oh, you're using a lot of red today, I see. You're, you're acknowledging your child because I think the danger when you have a lot of kids is that they don't feel seen. So just come and look at the stars with me or I see you're using a lot of red or I know you love mashed potatoes. You're seeing who your child is. And I think that's what matters. And when children feel seen, they don't have to elbow other people out of the way to get seen. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. This is so inspiring. And I know that Andrea and I are going to go back and re-listen to this mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure together. We find it really helpful to like get those, that specific scenario advice. Yeah. And that's you're so yeah. good at that. So I, I want to move on to kind of like the last final piece of like an important part, I think, for this conversation is – you have an article on your website about the secret to saying no ah. and why, what is the deal with that? Like, why is it, can't, I can't get my child to listen. My no is not my no. I have to resort to counting to one, two, three or else or threats or what else. So let's, let's hear yeah. you talk about that. We're back to setting limits. And I think that so often parents who are drawn to this kind of parenting aren't very good at setting limits. They don't know how to do it and they um, are afraid to do it. So I think it all starts as it always does inside us. We have to look at, well, what's keeping me from saying no? What am I afraid of? Well, I'm afraid my child will be mad at me. Like my parents were always ready to withdraw their love, so maybe my child will withdraw their love. I mean, that happens for a lot of parents. And I think we need to take that deep breath and we need to reparent ourselves. We need to say, it's okay for you to, to yourself. It's okay for you to set your limits, to say no. Your child loves you. They know you're the parent. They're not going anywhere. Parents are worried about their children's lack of affection, you know, will not be affectionate. But as long as you work on that bond, as long as everything's through the frame of we can be closer, you know, we can be connected, you can still say no in that context, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, let's say, again, we'll take it into another relationship. Let's say you and your partner have a difference of opinion because your partner wants you to be, you know, wants you to say yes to something that you really don't feel like you can say yes to. You're allowed to say no and you can still be just as close to your partner, mm-hmm. right? We we know instinctively if you have a good relationship, you know, there are t- like, like, you know, my husband loves to work in the tool shop with his power tools. I have zero interest in being in the garage with the power tools. and But I will go out and I'll admire what he does. He doesn't need to show me how to use a circular saw. I have no interest, right? He was originally like, let me show you how to use a circular saw. And I was like, I know you love it so much and I'm not going to do that, right? I'll, I'll come in. And also, I never learned to play tennis, which he loves. So I'm allowed to say no to him, right? And we can still have a good relationship. We can go hiking together. We can share other things together, not those two things he loves, right? As an example. Well, with my child, I can say no to things my child wants Mm -hmm. and we can still have a close relationship. I think that's the internal work we have to do to say we can do that. That's the first Mm -hmm. thing, what people say no. Okay. And there's there's also, I think, another fear too of when you go into this type of parenting, like, okay, the goal is no screaming, no like outbursts. And so I got to say yes, so there's not the outbursts. Oh, but to, wait a minute. We're uh, the ones who aren't supposed to scream. It's not that the child's not allowed to scream. Yes, yeah, so We are true. not. We, we, when we scream, we're making the child unsafe so their brain and nervous system become reactive, right? Yeah. We don't want that. And when we scream, we're teaching them that that's a good way to solve problems, that yes. that's what adults do to solve problems. We don't want that. Is the child not allowed to scream? Of course the child's allowed to scream. Your child has an immature brain and everything's an emergency to them when someone takes their bucket or whatever. It's an emergency. When you say no cookie before dinner, it's an emergency to them. They're going to scream. And parents will say, I don't know why he does that. I never hit him. Why is he hitting his little sister? Because it's an emergency to him that his little sister took his toy, right? Because his brain is still developing. Exactly. Exactly. So there's nothing... When I say peaceful, I'm yeah. describing your own heart. Your child is not going to be peaceful. Your child, it's peaceful parent, happy kid, yeah. right? The 
child is going to end up happy because they're going to be emotionally healthy. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to scream. That's not behavior. They're not allowed to hit. Yeah. They're allowed to. They're not allowed to throw their juice cup in your face. They're, they might do it. When I say they're not allowed to, you want it to not repeat, right? It's like, whoa, whoa, ouch. You threw your cup. You were so mad at me, right? No throwing. You can tell me, no, mommy, you know, whatever, right? You help them with the words so they don't have to throw the cup. Yeah. But they will always start out screaming. Mm -hmm. And when a child screams, we need to listen to what, why did they need to escalate to screaming? Mm -hmm. You know, kids go, you've probably noticed this, kids go through this stage at around... 12 months, 13 months, where they can't put much into words, almost nothing, but they desperately want some. They reach for something on the counter. They want their juice cup. It's on the counter. And they're like reaching for it, right? And if they think no help is forthcoming, they will escalate and be screaming in the most unbearable high-pitched wail like that. And the more they learn that you say, oh, that's your juice cup. You don't have to scream. You can say, cup, please. Here's your cup, sweetie, right? And your child learns over time, they learn to say cup please and not scream, right? That's how we stop our kid from screaming. We help them see how to advance their needs in a different way, period. So screaming is natural for kids. It's not that they're not allowed to scream, it's that our screaming is counterproductive. Yes. So you said, how do you say no? Yeah. I say you start inside yourself to look at what you're afraid of and then you get clarity about what matters to you and like, no, um, you know, I always, always used to say bedtime is bedtime. We're not navigating a new bedtime every night. It's like, this is what we expect. This is the routine. When you have routines in your family, kids stop challenging. Every, they don't have to fight with you about brushing teeth because that's the routine and they may not like it. No one likes to brush their teeth when they're, you know, no one probably likes to brush their teeth. I mean, maybe by adulthood. But the point is, if it's part of the routine, they won't fight you about it every night. I've definitely so, found that to be yeah, true. As soon as yeah. we implemented this like amazing chore chart, responsibility chart, mm -hmm. they knew exactly what was mm -hmm. coming every day. Mm -hmm. and it no longer became a fight. Yeah, It used yeah. to be like they were at the will of us, like, oh, what's happening next? What do we have to do next? And then we're like, oh my gosh, we need a reboot. They're at an age now where they can do schedules. Mm -hmm. We wrote it all down, got them their own chore charts with their own names on it. And now they know what's coming and they do not argue about it. They go, exactly. they go okay, yep, time to do this, time to do this. Because yeah. it's like learning responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So once you have that clarity inside yourself about what you're going to expect, then you just say, when they say, but I want that cookie before, and you say, no, no cookies before dinner. But you also say, you must be so hungry. It's hard to wait for dinner. You know what? I've got a carrot stick. No, no carrot. I want a cookie. And and you say, okay, you have a choice, carrot or milk. You could have a glass of milk, whatever. Something that will give them, maybe they don't drink milk, but something that will give them yes. a little, a little um, choice. Yes, exactly. Yes. A little choice and fill their belly up a little bit mm -hmm. um, so that they can wait for dinner. Yes. And you can still hold your no. And let's say your child throws themselves down on the floor and screams. It probably wasn't about the cookie. It was probably that they had a hard, long day and they're little and they just need to let out some of this emotion. And you say, and this is your busy time of day, right? And you're, yeah. you've got everybody's, you know, that's why they call it our snack hour, right? Um, and you, you've got, you know, you might turn off what's on the stove for a moment while you go d down on the floor and you say, oh, it's so hard for you when you want a cookie and you can't have one and you're so hungry before dinner. It's okay to cry. And some parents think that's coddling them. Mm -hmm. giving in. But what's that child supposed to do with all those feelings, right? Oh my gosh. I know this is like the most, the biggest piece to me when people think that that's coddling. I'm like in any adult relationship, just having someone acknowledge your feelings, no matter what the feelings are, yeah. makes it better. Yeah, It just does. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's for kids too. Yeah. yeah. And if you're having a hard time as an adult, let's say something happens and you're upset about it and you burst into tears. Maybe you even throw your glass, you know, whatever. You're so upset. That would be a pretty extreme reaction, yeah. but something just happened. Yeah. If the other adult in the room said, you go to your room and calm down and, you know, when you can behave yourself, you know. Or what is wrong with you? Yes. Like, yes. You're being ridiculous. You know, like all those things. This would only be in response to something really big, obviously, but mm. even bursting into tears, that something happened that is of magnitude to you. And when you feel understood, you will respond differently. So that toddler who's crying on the floor, you know, the tears have stress hormones. Ex some of the stress of the day is coming out mm -hmm. in the tears and actually being expelled from the body. And after that good cry, 
that child is going to feel better. Always. Yeah. Yeah. As we all do yes. after a good cry. Yes. And especially if someone's there just like letting you feel your feelings yes. and acknowledging them. Yes. Yes. If, you're, if your child's on the floor and you're like, ah, and you, that they're not going to feel better because no one's holding the space for them to have the feelings. They're just feeling shamed. And they're going to like pull themselves to sitting and be trying not to cry because mommy's making that uh, sound cheap that she doesn't like me when I do this. Whereas yes. if you can say you're having such a hard time, I do need to, you know, stir the vegetables, yep. but I'll come back and check on you in just a minute. Yeah. Uh, you know, then your child knows it's okay for them to cry yep. and you're coming back and forth. Yep. And so many of these examples go back to just like being in a rush in life too. Yeah. Like you're stressed, you're in a rush. And like you said, like if you have multiple kids. So an earlier example you gave where like, oh, the mom took the kid outside and locked the door. It reminds me of like maybe another scenario that could happen where maybe the mom's really busy and they're cooking and they have a newborn that's maybe crying and trying to tend to both those things and then you have two older siblings that are fighting and one's like right. pulling hair or something yeah. as a, a parent might be tempted to go oh oh you mm -hmm. know something because they feel like they can't handle it all at once and i don't know it just makes you think of how stressed life is sometimes when you're in yes. such a rush for everything yes like maybe dinner can wait maybe we can let dinner be 30 minutes later tonight maybe and and again you can put some hummus and carrot sticks out on the on the t low table for the kids so they're it takes a little of the edge off their hunger because they're always hungry at that time of day Yes, and take a breath. And also, it's okay to turn the things off, go over to your older two children who are pulling the hair and say, whoa, 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 ouch, that hurts. You're having such a hard time. We're going to talk about it and work this out. But right now, I know everybody's hungry. We need to get dinner going. So, and the baby's crying meanwhile on your hip and needs to eat or whatever. Um, and you say, so you can, you each need to do different things right now, and then we'll work it out later. What are you going to do? Yes, you can go in your room and read your book. What are you going to do? Yes, you can go over there to draw. You know, whatever. So it's fine to separate them and yep. work it out later. You don't have to like go through the whole scenario at this moment, right? Yes. Because you don't have the time to do that. Yes, yeah. But yeah. the difference is not the like the shaming, the blame, the yeah. guilt, the locking, and the, right. <laughs> that aspect. And again, when we're dysregulated, we act out of fear and then we shame and blame and no good for anybody. Yes. Did you finish your no section? Ah, so <laughs> we so, got getting well, distracted. Well, I guess that's the question. So we, we yeah, there's so much to say no, right? But it's okay to say no, but we always empathize at the same time. It's so hard to stop playing and get ready for bed. And it's time for bed, right? No, no cookie. Even if the child's on the floor crying, no cookie. And we're not going to shame and blame them for that reaction because in that case, it's probably not about the cookie, right? So it's completely fine to hold the boundaries that are super important. And you said, you know, people don't feel comfortable saying no. Why does my no not have power? Also, remember it takes two people to have a power struggle. If your child, if you're listening to this and your you're thinking, my child gets into a power struggle with me about everything. I would advise you that it takes two people to have a power struggle and you do not have to attend every power struggle you're invited to. <laughs> okay. So what's an example for that then? Okay. So you have a kid who everything you say, they're like, no, no, you know, and at that, like, and I'm, I'm thinking again of four-year-olds because four-year-olds are very interested in power. They want to know how do I get my needs met in this big world? And they often are very bossy with their friends four-year-olds and they're bossy with their siblings. And you know, if, if you're, um, as a parent, if you haven't yet learned to give your child the right to make decisions about things that are okay for them to make decisions about, y you're probably doing what I would consider over controlling. Mm. So I met one mom who was, she was, looked like a fashion model at all times, every minute. I don't know how she always looks so great. <laughs> and her daughter wanted to wear what she wanted to wear. And the mother's like, I can't let her wear flowers and stripes together. And I'm like, you absolutely you, can't. What do you care? I mean, you, well, well, people would judge her, she mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. And I said, they will judge you as being a good mom who lets your daughter express herself. And they'll know she dressed herself if she puts those three things on together. And that's fine, right? Absolutely. So, so I think sometimes we have to back off the control if we have a child who's saying no to us all the time, right? Because in this case, what was happening was the daughter, the mother would say, wear, the, wear this and wear this. And the daughter would say, no, I'm going to wear this. And the, they would get into a fight over it. Like, really? Yeah, That's yeah. what you want to fight over? Yeah, you pick your battles on the important things. And then there's also, I think, at the four-year-old age too, where you're kind of figuring out where, where, what they can do and how much they can or can't do. So you might say, okay, you need to clean your room. 
And then you'll realize, oh, okay, maybe they're not quite ready to clean their whole room all yeah. by themselves. Yeah. And you get in a pickle because you want your no to be your no and you don't want it. Oh, but right? it's fine to – that's a great example yeah. of where you might step back from your no because you realize it was an unreasonable no. Yeah. So you're saying, no, you can't go outside and play with your siblings until your room is clean. Yeah. And your kid's like, ah! Yeah. And – you know, some four-year-olds maybe could have handled that. Maybe your older child did it when she was four, but this one can't. For you know, everybody's different yes. at each age. So, so in that case, you say that is so hard to hear that you need to clean your room, and it feels so overwhelming. Yeah, it feels so overwhelming. Yeah, you know what? Let's figure it out together. Yeah, let's do it together. I'll help you. Yeah, you and you want your child to know that you're a safe place to come back to with what isn't working for them in life. So you, and they've always got backup and you say, we'll figure it out together. You say, right, give me a hug. Okay. The, in a room, what we need to do to clean your room is we need to pick up all the clothes on the floor and put them in the hamper and we need to pick up all the toys and put them on the shelf. Uh, the, maybe that's the what, books go here. Yeah. Just like clear, simple it's, guidelines. Yeah. They, they need to know like the simplest possible thing. Yep. Everything off the floor. Toys go on the shelf, books go on this shelf, and clothes go in the hamper. It might be that simple. That may be it. That's the most a four-year-old can probably handle. It's not like they're going to also probably make their bed. Although, you know, you could trade in one of those other things for it. But three things is yeah. all anyone can remember, certainly a four-year-old. The real point is you're there with them doing it, mm -hmm. right? There are some six-year-olds who can't clean their room up because, you know, maybe they have some ADHD and it's hard to focus, right? Or, you know, hard to be organized. Or maybe they just get distracted so easily. And that's fine to say... Oh, it feels so overwhelming. Let's work on this together. We'll figure it out. I'm right here. Mm, I love that. Oh, it's so good. Everything you said about that. It's a good reminder. So do you feel like we've talked enough about parents who are like, when when I say no, my child ignores me? Yeah, I feel like we could go into that a little bit more. There is there is another thing I would say to parents. If you feel like you're always saying no when your child ignores you, I would wonder if you're actually standing behind your no. Yeah. Because notice that I took that bucket away from the child, mm -hmm. that two-year-old. I took the bucket away from him. I did it in a really lovely way, but I did it. Mm -hmm. And I did not give the cookie to the kid. And yes. I insisted that the child clean up their room. So if the child is just saying no, like, and screens are a great example of this, yeah. where, you, where parents expect a child to be able to turn off a screen. Now, we know better. We know that when we're on a computer busy doing something and a kid is saying something, we're like, yeah. Go away, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we know that's our reaction. So yeah. why do we expect a child? Mm -hmm. Or we know, we know that Netflix is founded on a model and YouTube is founded on a model of showing you something new every time you're done with something and that we we look. We're like, "Oh, Hooked. that's where binge watching comes from, right?" Yeah. Adults. So how do we ever expect a 14-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 7-year-old to turn off the screen, right? It's right. very hard for them to do. Yeah. We, it's ad addictive. So parents will say, well, I say no, and she keeps watching the screen. Yep. You you have to, when the screen is off, you have to have a conversation about that and how hard it is to turn it off and don't make them bad and wrong. It's it's all YouTube and Netflix or whatever. You know, we, yes. we know this is how it works. Yeah, acknowledging that it is hard. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and then say, what can I do to make it easier for you? What can we do to make it easier? Usually you need something to go toward. When you turn off the screen, it can't be turn off the screen and do your homework. It has to be turn off the screen and come and let's have a little five-minute roughhousing session with each other and laugh and, you know, because yeah. they always want your attention, right? Yeah. Let's do that. Or it's time for a snack or it's time to go outside and, you know, throw a ball together. Something that they're going to look forward to. And even if it's go outside and run around the house three times, or my daughter used to do push-ups when she would get off the screen because it was like, it's physical, a way to remobilize that energy into something physical, right? Yeah. So you can always work with your child on how to turn off the screen, but you have to stand behind it. You say, it's very hard for you to turn this off. I know you want to get to the next level of the game and it's time to turn it off. Do you think you can do it or should I do it? Mm -hmm. And your child's like, no, no, mom, just wait a minute. And you say, two more minutes. <sighs> and you say, I hear you want two more minutes. You, I would always give one warning. Like it's five minute warning. The timer just went off. So you have a five minute warning. I'm setting it now for five minutes because it went off to give us the, the five minute warning. And then at the end of the five minutes when the kids, two more minutes, two more minutes, you say, I know we just had your extra five minutes. So I'm going to turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, mom, just I'm going to turn it off. I know it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Take a breath. 
and you you do whatever you need to. You can unplug it if that's what you have to do. You mm-hmm. turn the thing off, and then your child has a complete meltdown. Mm-hmm. But they learn. Yeah. Your no just stuck. Your no is your no. Yeah, yeah. And the difference is you're not going. I'm gonna like you're not yanking it out of the There's, whatever the wall, or th- grabbing it from them in this horrible way where you're so angry at them, or you're not saying no video games for a week because you didn't listen. Because that's the that's kind of where I think parents want to resort to, maybe because they're feeling busy and they're not feeling like they have the time to sit down and get on their level and get on that connection level. So they're like, if you don't turn it off right now, you lose your video games tomorrow as they're cooking in the kitchen. But it's that extra effort that makes all the world a difference because then over time they know your no is no and it doesn't have to be a shamey guilt thing and then yeah. it becomes easier yeah. in such quick time. And and that is really the final word on no is it's all about the way you say it and the connection you build as you do it. Because you can say you know, you want to do this? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to, and you pick them up and throw them around if they're two, you know, or, or no, we're not going to do that to your 14 year old, but we are going to have some time to, you know, do what we always do together where we have a cup of tea. Yes. Throw football. Whatever. The point is that we're always standing behind our no with connection because remember, they want this thing they want that you just said no to, but they want something else more. And that's the yeah. relationship with you. And so why are threats so bad? So why? Because I think that's the most common way to parent well, is if you don't do this, then this is well, going to happen. Well, so think about what you have to do with threats. Either you stand behind the threat and you do the threat yeah, or you don't. If you don't do the threat, then why would your child actually listen to you? Because they know, and in fact, often they know. Yeah, she's threatening, but she's not yelling really at the top of her lungs yet. And then finally, when she's screaming at the top of her lungs and grabbing the iPad out of my hands, oh, yeah, I'll listen to her now. Yeah. Right? You teach them. Yes. With the threats, it teaches them I that you know. have to escalate, it right? It really does. It teaches them one way or the other. <laughs> and, and let me ask you, when you're making, I'll ask everyone listening, when yeah. you're making a threat, you know, you're, you're of course, you're going to follow through, right? Because you're always making a threat from a very reasonable place where that would be a reasonable thing you would do, right? I mean, that's crazy. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of one mom who I was, I was on a phone call with her. This is years ago. We were in a group. She was, she was one of a few moms in a group I was leading. And in the background, we hear her husband screaming against the kid. And the husband is leaning against the door to the kid's room, holding the door shut and screaming, you're never going to come out of that room again. It's like, <laughs> Right. We're you're these ne- threats yeah. or we're going to stick to our threats, yeah, right? You're never going to follow through with that. And I understand, again, why parents feel powerless. Mm-hmm. They feel powerless in the face of their child saying, mm, like, whatever it was. And so they, they, they get dysregulated. They feel that the child is somehow being disrespectful. Your child wasn't disrespectful to not put down the screen. They were addicted to the screen. That may be something you need to work on. But they weren't necessarily. It wasn't about reflection. It's not about on you. you. It's, we make it about us too yeah. much. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. And so I would say to every parent who's who starts, they hear the threat coming out of their mouth. Stop. Drop your agenda. Breathe. Stop. Drop. Breathe. Take three deep breaths, and start over. Mm-hmm. Right. Start with connection. Yeah. Maybe it's your 14-year-old on the computer and you say, you come over and you you put your hand on their shoulder, you're connecting, and you say, whoa, Brent, need your attention. And Brent looks at you and says, not now, mom, not now. And you say, Brent, it's time. We need to turn it off. You had your extra five, you know, whatever you need to do. But you notice you've returned yourself to calm before you begin to interact. The minute you feel threatening, you already you know you're already dysregulating. You have to stop. You have to step back. Stop, drop, and breathe, and then you can start over. Yeah, because what you what you said earlier about you're teaching them mm-hmm. how to react to you is so key. Because if you just go to this pattern of saying no, and then they don't listen, then you do the count to three, and then you do the threat, and then you and it just keeps going and going. Then they're gonna learn. Oh, mom doesn't really mean no until she gets to that point. Exactly. But if you just say no and you go over and you have your connection, and then you remove this whatever the situation is. That's the no. Yeah. And so then they know. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to use anger to say no. You just have to mean your no and follow through on it. And it will always be more effective if you offer 
your child understanding as you do it. I yeah. know it's so hard yeah. to X, Y, Z, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And even if you find yourself, because I think a lot of people listening might not find themselves in a place where they want to implement everything that you're saying. And they're like, yes, I'm, and they might implement it maybe even 80% of the time, but then they find themselves, this is where I am, where I'll find myself every once in a while going to that place that I don't want to go. Yeah. And even if it's like a threat thing, like yeah. I'll go back and be like, okay, I'm sorry. that I don't know why I said that. I was just starting to lose my cool. I didn't mean it. I shouldn't have said that. Beautiful. And then start over. And that's yeah. something they're like, oh, this isn't mom's norm. They learn from that too because you're yeah. apologizing when you make your mistake, even into something like a threat. I love that. And I call it a do-over. And as we model it, they learn to do it too. Yeah. So you can say, oh, let's all have a do-over. And your child gets to start. I, I know you wanted X and your brother wanted Y. Let's all, and we, you both said things that hurt each other's feelings. Let's have a do-over. And if you've modeled that, they can do it with each other too. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay, any final takeaways for how we can connect more with our kids before we end this? I think you look at each child and you see who they are and how you can, what they need. Some, you know, back to love languages. You know, some kids really need to be touched. Other kids... It's in the language you use, the words. Some kids, it's, you know, referred to as acts of service, that you help them when they're trying to, you know, go to the soccer game and you help them not forget their shin guards. You make the list for them of what they need and you, you before, as you get into the car, you say, okay, where's your list? Let's look at that together. Or you wash their uniform for them for the big day or whatever. Things that are, are um, that child might consider to be love language. So we we look at what each child needs to feel valued and seen and loved by us. I think that's what matters to, to connect. Perfect. And Amazing. I do have one other thing to say to parents. Yes, say it. I've mentioned self-compassion. Research is pretty clear that when we are nicer to ourselves, we are nicer people. And most parents don't think that. They think, well, I'm letting myself off the hook. I lost it. I yelled at my kids. That was terrible. I don't want to be that person. And of course, yes, yes, I want to give that mom a hug or that dad a hug and say, of course, you don't want to be that person. And it's understandable. And if any of us were in your exact shoes, we would have done the same thing. And I mean that. I mean, with your, you know, lack of sleep the night before and your, you know, kids doing whatever they were doing at that moment and your worries about money or health or whatever else and and your exact genetics and you know everything that brought you to this moment it was a hard moment there are hard moments in everyone's life give yourself that let yourself off the hook hug yourself as i say we have to reparent ourselves that's the big secret is we have to learn to be our own parent and give ourselves what we need and then you know, just be kind to yourself and then say, okay, let's replay this. Just like you did with your child. What could you do with that Nerf gun instead of shooting in your brother's face, right? Let's replay that. What could I do if I'm in this situation tomorrow? Well, first of all, I'm going to go to bed early. Or secondly, I'm going to stop before it gets out of hand and separate the kids so they're not pulling each other's hair. Whatever the thing is that we need to do so we're not escalating, right, at that moment. And you know, some, as I say, parents think they're letting them, people think they're letting themselves off the hook. It turns out that actually people who are more self-compassionate are more loving, mm -hmm. not just to themselves, but to other people because they have more love inside. Mm -hmm. That's less shame, less blame, more love. That's what we need to do to make the world a better place and to be the parents we want to be. Yeah, absolutely. All this whole conversation really centers around like healing us as people, as yeah. a, as a, a collective. Yes. Because yes. it starts with how we're raising our little yeah. babies and yeah. how they grow up to be to raise their babies exactly. and so on and how they treat everybody around them. Yes. And the children we are raising every day are going to be the people who will populate the planet after we're gone. And wouldn't it be an amazing world if all of them learned how to be more emotionally generous? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. This is amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm so honored and so thankful to have this conversation and pick your brain on things and get new inspiration. So I really appreciate it. And you're just incredible. So thanks for being here. This has been so much fun. Yes. And your children are wonderful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. We're going to end it now. Bye. Bye.